welcome all live and future viewers to History Mama, the part of the show where I talk about a piece of history that I think is super, super important. And here on History Mama, we do basically a casual oral retelling of history. Um, the research for this was done by my wonderful researcher who goes by the name of Silent. Um, and they uh, got us a bunch of information That's together good. and then I put it together and I review it and I make it into a, a understandable story for all of you. I am not a, uh, a accredited historian. This is a people's history. This is a, uh, we do a bunch of research from real historians, we put it together and we give you the seeds of knowledge that you need to go pursue and learn more. And what we're going to be talking about today is a super, super amazing piece of history, okay? I'm not a credited historian. It's true. I'm not. I'm not. I am not a historian. I am just a history buff. Okay? That's what I am. And I like to share pieces of history so that people can go and learn more about it themselves if they find it as fascinating as I do. I think this one is particularly fascinating. What we are going to be talking about today is a man by the name of Magnus Hirschfeld. Magnus Hirschfeld was a German Jewish scientist and doctor who founded a institute in Germany which is largely recognized as the first LGBT clinic in the world. Now, I will warn you in advance, there's going to be some content warnings here because this gets very dark. Magnus Hirschfeld's uh, Institute for Sexual Studies operated and ended because it operated under and ended during the reign of the, of the Nazis. So, unfortunately, there is some dark stuff here, but this is a lesson that we should learn from and that we should be able to recognize that trans people aren't some new thing that has appeared out of nowhere. Trans people have been around through, for, through all of history. I am trans, and our history is more than we know it. Part of the process of me uh, leaving the hyper-religious background that I came into, that I was born into and was raised in, and learning about myself and recognizing that I was trans and transitioning um, has been a big part of that, has been having to desperately sort of look through and try and find the past of people like myself. Unfortunately, trans and LGBT in general history is often erased or destroyed outright. Yeah, if, if you've, exactly, Silent brings up a great point, which is to say, if you've watched the History Mama segments on Stonewall and the Compton Cafeteria Riots, you've heard us mention Hirschfeld. Hirschfeld. But we're going to get, um, we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of this, starting right now. So our story, we're going to crank back the clock, the hands of time, and we're going to go back to the year 1868. Wow, that's a long time ago, you might all say. Well, it's not that long if you in the big picture. But in 1868, Magnus Hirschfeld was born. He was born to a highly regarded, very well-respected uh, physician and senior medical officer. In 1892, he finished his education and earned his medical degree. And then, in 1893, he visited the U.S. He traveled to the United States for eight months, and while he was there, he went to the World Fair, the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. You all have probably heard of this many times. The World Fair was a, uh, a science utopia. It was a science carnival. A bunch of nerds get together and talk about cool stuff. However, while Magnus Hirschfeld was there, he came into contact with the homosexual subculture that existed in Chicago. And he noticed it. He noted very similar, even though they were separated by culture and, and geography, he noted that there were very specific similarities between Berlin's underground homosexual community and the homosexual underground community in Chicago. Even though they didn't even speak the same language, there were these similarities. And Hirschfeld began to develop a theory of universality of homosexuality around the world. 
he started studying books and newspapers about all of the different gay subcultures that existed in Rio, in Tokyo, in, in, in New York, in all of these different places. He went and learned, uh, he, he read as much as he could to understand the sort of uh, gay subcultures. Um, in 19, sorry, in 1896, after returning from America, he moved his practice from Magdeburg, Ger Germany, to Berlin, the capital of Germany. And when he did that, he was uh, at the time studying a particular trouble uh, that was on, uh, that was sort of blighting the, the queer community of the time, the gay community of that time. Um, what he was researching was the shockingly high suicide rate, um, which was, and by the way, at the time in Germany, suicide was con was very taboo. It was very, very taboo. It was considered a, a character flaw if you killed yourself. And yet, nonetheless, there were a lot of German gays who were killing themselves. And as a result, this prompted Hirschfeld to become interested in gay rights. That's right. Hirschfeld saw the sadness and the suffering of a community that was marginalized and mistreated, and he said, this is wrong. We need to change this. In specific, Hirschfeld pointed to a, a case of a young army officer who left behind a suicide note, which made it clear that despite this, this soldier's uh, best efforts to, to, to keep going, that he could not end his desires for men, which he, see, he saw as essential to continuing his life. Because he couldn't stop loving men, he decided to kill himself. And Hirschfeld was actually mentioned in this soldier's note. The thought that you, referring to Hirschfeld, could contribute to a future where German, the German fatherland will think of us more in terms, just sweeten, in, 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 in more just terms, sweetens the hour of my death. So literally, the last thing this guy wrote was saying, thank you for fighting for a world that will accept us. Thank you for fighting for a world where we won't have to do this. That is heartbreaking. And this was happening in 1896. Remember, not 1996, 1896. This is why this story is so interesting to me and why I'm so happy to share it all with you. Now, this same, in, within this same sort of stretch of years, the trial of Oscar Wilde, a famous homosexual, was well covered in Germany. Lots of the German press was talking about this. Um, and during this time, Hirschfeld uh, had a lot of his patients, his gay patients, um, they uh, had, he noticed that a lot of them that hadn't committed suicide had scars from suicide attempts. It was so great that he was taking note of this. That, that his patients would come in with scars from attempting to harm themselves, from attempting to kill themselves. And as you all know, this is something we still deal with right now. The suicide rate among, among gay and specifically trans youth is ridiculously high. And it's not because of some intrinsic trait. It's not because gay people want to kill themselves more or because trans people want to kill themselves more. It's because society ostracizes them and humans are social creatures. And Magnus Hirschfeld recognized this. The premier scientist at this time, the only guy on the planet who was actually doing research into gay people realized that. And he acknowledged that at the time over a hundred years ago. Now, um, in, in, in the fall of 1896, the Great Industrial Exhibition of Berlin occurred. And um, you have probably heard of this before. You've probably, you probably don't know, you don't, probably don't know the name of it, but you've probably heard of it. It was the German event that had human zoos. Yeah, that's, that was a thing in that time. They had kidnapped people from colonies and put them into displays, um, largely people from the German colonies in New Guinea and Africa. It was called the Great Industrial Exhibition of Berlin. Many people have heard of this, um, and, uh, uh, and it is disgusting, just disgusting. 
But again, just goes to show you the sorts of conditions that people would do. Yeah, world fairs at the time would feature human zoos with exotic people. Was Magnus known to be gay? We'll, we'll get there. So while when he went to this exhibition, he went and he specifically tried to com he went and talked with those native people who'd been imprisoned and he asked them about sexuality in their culture. He talk about a guy who was devoted to humanizing people. Obviously, there's nothing he can do to stop the industrial ex exhibitions, these human zoos. But he went there to talk about to talk to them as humans to ask them questions so that he could make the world a better place. And he began writing a book that would later be published some, some time later, which was called The Homosexuality of Men and Women. At the time, shortly after his, his, his conversations with these uh, kidnapped natives, um, he issued a pamphlet called Sappho and Socrates, which he wrote under a pseudonym. Uh, and this talked about the historical precedence of homosexual love. So this was a guy who was really devoted to all of this. Just an absolute, yeah, an absolute chad. So then, you know, his life continues. All this stuff is going on. And in 1897, he founded an organization called the Scientific Humanitarian Committee. Committee, And he had a couple of friends who did this with him, including a publisher by the name of Max Sofer, uh, a lawyer named Edward Ober, and a writer, Franz Joseph von Bulau. Yeah, we can probably do that. That would be super cool. That would be super, super cool, Silent. Um, and this organization was created with the goal of defending the rights of homosexuals in Germany. Dude is a straight-up activist. This is in 1897, remember? Seriously. And uh, their, their stated goal was to defend the rights of homosexuals, and specifically, they wanted to repeal a piece of the German penal code which was called Paragraph 175. This was what criminalized homosexuality completely. You were, it was illegal to be gay. It was illegal to engage in homosexual behaviors at all. And that had existed since 1871. So this specific outlaw of, gay, of, of homosexual behavior had been in the law since, bef since before, since what? short two years after three years after he was born this is a law that he had he that him and his patients had lived under for the entirety of his life before he even knew anything about gay people and they argued that the law encourages the blackmail of homosexuals and that people um and then they adopted a a motto which was justice through science which hirschfeld would um would be his personal motto he believed very much that science could lead us to just outcomes if we honestly engaged with science. And his committee, again, called the Scientific Humanitarian Committee in Germany, was able to gather 6,000 signatures from prominent Germans to overturn that paragraph, including Albert Einstein and a whole bunch of socialist po politicians. Interesting how that works, that at the time even, socialists were willing to consider the well-being of homosexuals. Poets, authors, artists, and of course Albert Einstein all signed up to overturn this. And one year later, it reached the Reichstag. The bill to overturn paragraph 175 is brought before the Reichstag in 1898. But it was unfortunately only supported by a minority of the Social Democratic Party of Germany at the time. Hirschfeld spoke out at this, uh, at this when, when the bill came to the Reichstag. Um, when the bill came to the Reichstag, Hirschfeld gave a speech. And in this speech, he talked about the suicidality and, and was able to be the first person to ever present statistical evidence to a legal court um, that homosexual that homosexual people commit suicide significantly more frequently than heterosexual people. And by using anonymous questionnaires, look at that. In 1898, he was keeping patient privacy in mind. It's almost like having a 
a, an approach whereby you witness and you and you acknowledge the humanity of the people that you're working with is incredibly important to good outcomes. But using anonymous questionnaires, he was able to estimate that three out of every 100 gay men committed suicide every year, and that a quarter of gay men, a 25 out of 100 gay men, had attempted suicide at some point in their lives. And that meant, and that the remaining three quarters had experienced suicidal ideations at some point. That is wild. 100, according to his questionnaires, 100% of all gay people had either had serious suicidal ideation, a suicide attempt, or successfully committed suicide. And that's just the men. And his conclusion, though, his conclusion wasn't that gay people are inherently flawed or that there's anything wrong with them. His conclusion was that life under the German social conditions were unbearable for gay people. That the, the social atmosphere of Germany was hostile to its core to gay people, and that is what he argued. Unfortunately, it didn't pass. Was he working with women too? Yes, he was. Um, but a lot of his stuff, unfortunately, focused on, on men. However, that will change, and you'll see. So now we're going to jump a little bit further, a couple years into the future. The year is 1905. Hirschfeld Hirschfeld joins the League for the Protection of Mothers. This is a feminist organization which was founded by Helene Stalker. Yeah, 1905. He actively campaigns for decriminalization of abortion and, he, and argues against banning female teachers and civil ser servants from marrying or having children, which that was a thing at the time, by the way. Uh, female teachers and civil servants um, were banned from marrying or having children at the time. Isn't that wild? You either had to commit yourself to the state or you had to commit yourself to the to your husband. Now, Hirschfeld and Stalker, the, the person who founded the League for the Protection of Mothers, argued um, or, or they shared a belief that um, gay rights and women's rights were, were tied together. They strongly believed that gay rights and women's rights were, were one struggle in the same. Look at that. Intersectionality before intersectionality. Solidarity before solidarity. Incredible. Stalker was very much in, involved in the, in the previous campaign to repeal paragraph 175. So the person who founded this feminist organization was also very involved in the struggle for gay rights in Germany. Now, at this time, Hirschfeld got involved in a whole bunch of public debates. Um, damn. Look at that. Lefties doing debates back in the fucking 1900s. Look at how, how times are... Uh, it, it's like nothing's changed at all. Um, and he got involved in debates with a ton of different people. And um, this is going to be a little bit of a, of a very weird topic. Hirschfield. Where were we? Debating. Yeah, look. Lefties doing debates. Damn, queer people doing debates. Looks like nothing has changed at all. Hirschfeld becomes involved in a very intense debate with uh, a with a bunch of other uh, of his academic compatriots about a very strange subject. Okay, so bear with me. This is a very weird. Uh, this is one of those very weird things that you you can't believe that anybody actually argued about, but that they did it. This is called the hot and pot apron. <sighs> The, the idea of the Hottentot apron was a belief that the, the Khoi Khoi people, called, which who were renamed by Westerners as Hottentots, um, the women who were, uh, sorry, sorry, my apologies. The Khoi Khoi people, which were called Hottentots by the Germans, um, were a tribe of people in South Africa. Now, they believed, there was a belief among anthropologists at the time, that the women of this tribe, of this group of people, um, had abnormally enlarged labia. For those of you who don't know, that is a part of uh, female anatomy. Um, it is largely referred to as the, the lips of the vulva. They believed that the Hottentots had extra large labia, which inclined them towards being lesbians. Huh. Now... 
while I understand, uh, like, a, a certain jokey level of being like, oh, yeah, they got those labias. They must love being lesbians, right? Maybe because it feels good or something. But that's pretty silly, right? Well, a lot of people believed it at the time. But Hirschfeld did not. In fact, Hirschfeld argued that there was no, not only was there no evidence of them being, um, of them being, like, uniquely, uh, like, uh, uniquely biased towards being lesbians, but that they didn't even actually have larger labia. He went and did research and found out that actually they, their bodies were almost no different. They were super similar. They had actually similar, you know, measurements to German women. And he began to argue at the time that it was a social feature that there were more lesbian Kokoi women. Because it couldn't be their bodies. There had to be social features. And this proved this added evidence to his theory that spectrum that a spectrum of sexuality exists across all of humanity that is independent uh, of, of culture, but that can be affected by culture. That was what his argument was. And he was arguing back and forth with tons of prominent anthropologists. His works were published, his, his arguments were published, his letters were published, and you can find a lot of these to this day. And this argument continued. Uh, he, he would argue with these people for a long time. Now, we're going to, now that was just a, a piece of the features of the things that he was arguing with during this period. Because we're about to get, uh, things are about to get a lot more intense. In 19, but between 1906 and 1909, a number of events happened. This was in 1905, yes. This was in 1905 that he started arguing with a bunch of um, anthropologists over this specific thing. Oh, by the way, I should notice, I should note, he specifically called out white supremacy in his work. He believed that the reason why so many anthropologists were concluding that, uh, that these women had big labia that made them lesbians um, was as a result of white supremacy. In 1905, he was the first SJW, wasn't he? Can you imagine a bunch of Germans sitting around smoking pipes and going, oh boy, here comes that, that SJW bastard Hirschfeld. It's funny. Yeah. Chad SJW Hirschfeld. Yeah, it is. It is. It is the bit of that trope, Jade Monkey. Yep. So let's continue. Now, in, uh, okay, so between the years of 1906 and 1909, a couple of things happened. One of which was the Eulenburg Affair. Okay, I'm going to teach you about the Eulenburg Affair now. This was a big deal in Germany, arguably the most widely publicized sex scandal in the entirety of German history up to that point. Like, huge, okay? Journalist Maximilian Hardin made accusations of homosexual conduct, conduct between Kaiser Wilhelm's close friend Philip, the Prince of Eulenburg Hertfeld, and General Kuno, Graf von Moltke, which led to a series of court martials and five civil trials. All because a journalist created a moral panic. Sound a little familiar? Sorry to keep beating on that drum, but just, just going to say, little interesting how that works, isn't it? Little interesting how a, a journalist makes an accusation of, of homosexual relations between a prince and a general, and it leads to court martials and civil cases. Now, of, co of course, our based boy, Hirschfeld, testified on behalf of Hardin as an expert witness that Moltke was gay. However, he believed that proving that army officers like Moltke were gay would help the case to overall to overturn paragraph 175. And he believed there was nothing wrong with being gay. So that's right. He actually went in as a witness for the journalist and then argued, yeah, he's gay. So what? That's kind of pog. Unfortunately, though, um, well, actually, no, no, uh, hold on. I should, I should, <laughs> let us continue. 
I'll, I'll get there. Hirschfeld's testimony was that homosexuality is part of the plan of nature and God's creation, just like any normal love. And this caused outrage all across Germany, and it led to him being smeared in newspapers all across the country. So Hirschfeld goes up there and says, you all motherfuckers want to make the gays feel bad, but this is just as normal as anything you all are doing. And unfortunately, the jury ruled in the favor of the journalist. However, Judge Hug Isenbel overturned the verdict under the grounds that homosexuals have the morals of dogs and that the verdict couldn't be allowed to stand. So what basically happened here is it was, it's a mess. It's a mess. And a second trial ended up finding Hardin guilty of, libe of libel. Hirschfeld testified in this trial, but argued that Moltke and Eulenberg had a homoerotic friendship that was not sexual. So this is a little interesting. Remember how, and I'm going to do a little throwback to my own thing here. Remember how in, during the, the, the kink at pride discussion that happened this, during this year's pride, all over Twitter is a huge discussion. Lots of people were talking about it. I said that most laws are targeting actions. They don't target identity. There is very few laws that say it is illegal to be gay because you can't prove that some you can't prove someone's essential traits. Most of the laws target actions, and that's why we can't just say that a legal victory that says you can be gay but don't do any of that degenerate stuff, doesn't work. And that happened here, in this trial we're talking about right now. He tried to argue that, no, 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 they just, had, they just loved each other. They didn't do the gay sex because the German law would have convicted them uh, uh, for, for under, yeah, under obscenity laws. He cast doubt on the testimony of Moltke's former wife, which before he had defended. He was at this time... Um, being threatened on a personal level, not just by journalists, but he was threatened by the Prussian government of the time to have his medical license revoked and then himself be prosecuted for violating paragraph 175. Silent notes, my researcher silent notes, there's actually more to it than that even that we didn't add in here. He basically walked back all of his previous testimony because he was so threatened by the Prussian government. This scandal resulted in a massive surge of homophobic and, interestingly, anti-Semitic backlash, as at this time, the Volkish movement. Now, this is something I want to touch on. This is something I want to touch on. Does anybody know what the Volkish movement was? Volk is a German word that translates to folk. In fact, it's where our word folk comes from. It was, with to be a little crude, it was the MAGA of the time. The Volkish, arg uh, the Volkish movement argued that people needed to go back to traditional Germanic folk or Volk. Interesting. We hear echoes of that to this day. In, in the rhetoric of far-right traditionalists. The Volkish movement um, put their, their, their support um, behind, uh, uh, behind the, uh, the other people that were against them, and they argued that he was an Aryan heterosexual who was framed by false claims of homosexualities by Jews. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Hirschfeld concluded that the affair had, counter to his intentions, set the movement for gay rights back considerably, as well as uh, the enforcement of paragraph 175 increased after this. Hirschfeld tried to do the right thing, and it didn't work. It's unfortunate, but it didn't. Unfortunately, that happens. It's why it's important for us to recognize that even, remember, the laws were less just last month, we had a discussion about, uh, in America, Pennsylvania upheld anti-homosexual obscenity laws in their state penal code. These are laws that make it illegal to engage in homosexual activity under the guise of public indecency. This is in America in 2021, right now. 
and the Republican legislature of Pennsylvania upheld this law. And when I talked about it, a lot of people said, well, it, is it enforced? Is it enforced? Doesn't matter. It, it shouldn't be on the books. Even if they don't enforce it at the time, nothing says they won't enforce it in the future. And this is a perfect historical example of this. Paragraph 175 was not frequently used in the past. It was used, but it wasn't frequently used. And then it became more when the Volkish movement started targeting Jews and homosexuals. Now we're going to jump forward a few years. So, of course, Hirschfeld is still doing his work in Germany. He's still giving health care to gay and, interestingly, trans people, as we will discover. And in 1918, the November Revolution happened in Germany, which established the Weimar Republic, the Weimar Republic. And this led to uh, Prussia and specifically Berlin becoming a haven for homosexuals. A lot of gay people went to Berlin because it was controlled at the time by the social democratic Prussian government, which was much more progressive with regard to gay people. Weimar, yeah, I know, I probably said it wrong. Otto, Otto Braun, at the time, ordered the Prussian police to not enforce paragraph 175. Seems like a win, right? But the law's not off the books. They were just ordered by the current leader, who was happened to be progressive, to not enforce the law. In 1919, Hirschfeld co-wrote and acts in a film. And we're going to watch this film. That's right. We're going to watch this film together here in just a minute. But I'm going to tell you about it first. Yeah, that's right. We're going to watch the actual film, at least what remains of it. Uh, a lot of copies were destroyed. And so we have a copy that has some of the scenes. The film was called Different from the Others. And in this film, uh, a very, very famous German actor named Conrad Veit, 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 played a gay character who was targeted by blackmail. He came out and became publicly gay in the film instead of, being, instead of continuing to pay his blackmailers. And this led to his career being destroyed and he was driven to suicide. The film highlighted Hirschfeld's main argument for overthrowing paragraph 175. This is a piece of artistic activism. And the film ended with Hirschfeld giving a, a sort of speech to the main character's husband and lover who was planning to kill himself. And this was Hirschfeld's lines. Ready? I'm going to read you Hirsch, Hirschfeld's lines. If you want to honor the memory of your dead friend, you must not take your own life, but please preserve it to change the preju prejudices whose victim, one of countly, countless many, this dead man was. That is the task of the living that I assign to you. Just as Zola struggled on behalf of a man who innocently languished in prison, what matters now is to restore honor and justice to the many thousands before us, with us and after us, through knowledge to justice. That's it. You heard it here, folks. Magnus Hirschfeld said, don't die. That is the task of the living I assign to you. And we're going to watch these scenes because I think this is um, striking and stark and important. Okay? So let's watch this together real quick. Let's watch some of these scenes, shall we? Look at this. This is scenes from Different from the Others, published in 1919, starring a famous German actor and Magnus Hirschfeld himself. Let's watch. Oh no, he said a mean thing to them. Uh-oh.
Damn, I know that. Damn. Damn, isn't that a mood right there? Across time. Across time, my lovely imps. Across time. Paul, I need an additional 10,000 marks to keep silent. Don't make me wait, or you'll have only yourself to blame for the consequences. Franz Bolek. The man who saw them walking together, holding hands in love, was threatening them for $10,000 to stay silent. It's nothing, an unpleasant business affair. I'm putting a stop to your blackmail. You'll get not one more penny from me. Says Paul, says Paul, back. And now he has an evil look on his, on his face. And that is what survives of Magnus Hirschfeld, of one of, of the film Magnus Hirschfeld worked on. So as you can see, we don't have much left of the film. And there's a reason for that, which we're going to get to, get to soon. But that's a pretty moving film, right? Made in 1919 about gay people being blackmailed because of the existence of obscenity laws. That's what remains of the film. I know, it's very emotional. It, it's beautiful. But let's continue, shall we? Later that year, on July 6th of 1919, Magnus Hirschfeld would open the Institute of Sexual, uh, sorry, of the Institute of Sexual Research, which was in a villa not far away from the Reichstag itself. It housed a massive archive and library of educational uh, materials, of medical uh, documents, of medical consultations. And also, it actively did work for women, gay people, and trans people. Approximate, oh, okay, interesting. Silent says, if my conversion is correct, 10,000 German marks in 1919 was 1312 USD in 1919. So, uh, that would translate to about $4,697 today. It's a lot of money. How many of you could come up with $4,697 if you were blackmailed? <laughs> Probably none of us. Let's be real. Not even I could. I couldn't come up with that. So this institute that he founded had gay-friendly psychiatrists, gynecologists, dermatologists, and interestingly, an endocrinologist. Let me ask you, why would you need an endocrinologist? Could it be that his institute was exploring hormone therapy for trans people in as early as 1919? Wow, how interesting. Hmm, how interesting. Almost like they were. It also housed a museum of sex, a publicly available educational resource that was visited by many school classes at the time to learn about what we knew about human sexuality. Hirschfeld lived in the institution with his partner and his sister. 
the institute attracted visitors like all over the world. It was a destination. It was the only clinic of its type that we know of in the world. There may have been others elsewhere, but this is the only one that we really know of at this moment. That's like of any notable repute. People traveled all over and they provided living accommodations on site. So they would allow uh, gay people to live in the facility if they needed to. That's incredible. Yeah, sounds an awful light, a lot, an awful lot like Professor X. It wouldn't surprise me if there was some inspiration drawn. Yeah, it's like gay Hogwarts, but better. It's like, yeah, it's like, it's like the the, it's like Professor X. Yeah, kind of cool, huh? Right, trans girl Lily. Trans girl Lily says HRT and free housing while I transition. That sounds pog as hell. Yeah, it kind of is. And this is in 1919. I know, it's hard to believe. Don't ever, all of you who are here, if there's something you take away from this, don't you ever believe, ever for a minute, that trans people are some new thing that have come out of nowhere, or that gay people are some new thing that have come out of nowhere. We've always been around, and Magnus Hirschfeld proved that. So... A number of prominent people ended up taking up residence at the Institute for Sexual Studies. One of those was Willy Musenberg, a member of the German parliament and a press officer for the Communist Party of Germany. Dorin, Dorin, Dor, Dorchen Richter was one of the first patients to receive sex reassignment surgery at the Institute. In 1919, Dorin Richter received sexual reassignment surgery. What? Holy shit! The Institute then served as a haven for what, uh, at the time, Hirschfeld referred to as transvestites, but what we would probably call transsexuals or transgender people. At the time, the term that they used was transvestites. And he offered them abuse shelter, he offered surgeries for them, and he even gave them jobs at the Institute. So they would have things to do and get and get money while helping around the institute, helping other members of their community. And it was very difficult if you were if you were a transvestite at the time, what they called a transvestite. If you were a transgender at the time, you could not get work. You would not be able to get work. Hirschfeld personally coined the terms transvestite and transsexual. That's a tidbit I didn't know. He yes, cock whisper. It was invented by Magnus Hirschfeld. I just found that out. I didn't know that actually. That was one. Tidbit, even I didn't know about this. The Institute also would issue transvestite certificates to trans people to prevent them from being harassed by the police. So if, if trans people were harassed by the police, they would be able to bring out a document that would be signed by Magnus that would say, hey, yes, a doctor has signed off for this. This is good for me. Isn't that wild? By 1923... Hirschfeld would have coined the term transsexual, which would differentiate it from intersexuality. At the time, they understood that intersexuality existed, and now they had a term called transsexual that was for something else, for somebody who wanted to cross sex. Authority Denial says, Hey, Demon Mama, I'm crying so much. Thank you for what you do. This is very important work. If I'm completely honest with you, I believe that History Mama is the only work that I do that is truly important. This is the stuff that I want to survive and will be archived and saved and accessible to people. Please, set, comment on the History Mama videos. Send them around. I have a whole playlist of History Mamas you can send around. This is what I think is the most valuable stuff that I do on my channel. I mean, I mean it. Everything else is just set dressing for this sort of thing. And now it gets a little dark, guys. And uh, again... I know it's really hard to hear some of this stuff, but bear with me because it's important that we bear witness to all of history and not just the good parts. In 1920, Hirschfeld was beaten severely by a group of Volkish activists. And they attacked him on the streets. He was, he was so beaten that he was actually pronounced dead when he was first found. That's how badly he was beaten. This was 1920. 
1920, Hirschfeld was beaten within an inch of his life by Volkish activists who ambushed him on the streets for his specifically for his work supporting degenerate homosexuals and transsexuals. And he continued his work afterwards, despite being injured within an inch of his life. And he held on. And in 1929, as a result of the efforts of himself and many other activists, the, the, the Mueller government at the time came incredibly close to repealing paragraph 175. However, it failed. The attempt to remove it once and for all failed again in the Reichstag. And at this point, as a result of the coverage, the state grew increasingly hostile towards gay rights campaigners. The activists were the ones who began to get targeted now. And that meant that Hirschfeld had to leave Germany for a while. He went and traveled abroad because he was rightfully scared of getting killed. And in 1930, Hirschfeld left to go to the U.S., um, when he was in the U.S., he kept his opinions on homosexuality very, very quiet, and his goal was to improve the sex lives of American men by encouraging them to be emotionally intimate with their partners. So Hirschfeld came to America and functionally engaged in uh, in in feminist and and uh, emotional well-being, basically saying, "Stop beating your wives. Please be emotionally intimate with your partners." And um, Initially, he was promoted um, by American journalists as doing a good thing because he was treating heterosexual couples. But however, shortly after this, they found his statements in support of gay rights in Germany, and he had to leave the U.S. So he left for one year to America, got celebrated at first, and then was quite literally canceled because of his previous statements in Germany about gay rights. And he had to leave the U.S. In 1931, Hirschfeld went to Ger or was invited to Japan by Keizo Dohi, a German-educated Japanese doctor who had worked at his institute during the 1920s. He met with a number of Japanese fem feminists in Japan, and he offered them, and he was very, very, had high praise for them. And while he was there, the Japanese government got very, very annoyed that he was uh, supporting this. The, the Japanese government got mad that he was supporting and promoting homosexuality. And so uh, he left to China. <laughs> Germany, U.S., Japan, China, all in the early 1900s. This guy's going all over the world in the 1900s. And in China, Hirschfeld met a young man who was studying sexology. Uh, this person's name was Tao Li, and Tao Li became Magnus Hirschfeld's partner for the rest of their life. Tao Li's parents were accepting of him being a gay man, and they were accepting of his relationship with Magnus Hirschfeld. And they literally threw a party when he finally left China because they were so happy that him and his lover, Tao Li, were... Uh, were together. That's pretty amazing. In 1932, some political events happened in Germany that are very, very important here. Okay? Yeah, he goes all over the place. Yeah, Silent mentions, yes, he did. He traveled all over the place. He didn't just stop in China. He ended up going to the Philippines, to Egypt, to Palestine, to Greece. He went to many, many places trying to figure out what um, he could do to improve the rights and the well-being of gay people worldwide. And um, meanwhile, while he was doing all this traveling, uh, on July 20th of 1932, Chancellor Franz von Papen carried out a coup in Germany that deposes uh, that deposed the, the, the previous leader, Braun, uh, for the government of Prussia, and he appointed himself as the Reich Commissioner for the state. He ordered the police to inf to begin enforcing paragraph 175 again, and the police began to harass people associated with Magnus Hirschfeld's Institute for Sexual Studies. Hirschfeld, at this point, 
after his travels, settled down in Switzerland. And of course, this continued, because in 1933, we all know what happened. We all know what happened in 1933, which is that Adolf Hitler was appointed chancellor in January of 1933. On May 6th, in the morning, a group of university students belonging to the National Socialist Student League stormed the Institute shouting, Burn Hirschfeld. Now keep in mind, the Nazi Student League, the, not the Hitler Youth, stormed the, the Hirschfeld Institute for Sexual Studies. They beat the staff. They destroyed uh, the entire building, just absolutely destroyed. And in the afternoon, the Sturm, sorry, let me pronounce this, Sturma Bietelung, the, the paramilitary, a paramilitary arm of the Nazi party. Notice how I've talked about this many times, how Germany was full of paramilitary groups. Just like America is right now, the paramilitary arm of the Nazi party showed up. They removed all of the volumes of the library and they burned it at an event which occurred four days later. That evening, the Berlin police, after the burning, You've seen this picture. You've seen the picture of the kids throwing books into the fire. Those books that they were throwing were the works of Magnus Hirschfeld and many, many other doctors. All of the records of, of the Institute were destroyed. I can pull it up. Yeah, let me, find the, let me find the picture. Let me show you. You've seen this picture. You've seen this in your books. You've seen this in your history books, but I bet you didn't know what they were burning, did you? Did you? You didn't know that they were burning trans, uh, trans and gay healthcare books. Which were functionally the only existing copies at the time. They never tell anybody that. The book burnings in Germany, 1933. This was the book burning right here. This is the one we were talking about. No one has, I was never taught this. I learned this because of pers like personal research. Yeah, you were. Yeah, Windleby says we were taught they burned the works of people who were enemies of the Nazi Party. They never mentioned who the enemies were. The enemies were doctors, doctors who were helping gay people. That was whose books were burnt. You were told they were burning Bibles? No, they were not. They were not burning Bibles. That was not Bibles they were burning. The Nazis were Christians. And at this point, Doran Richter, the first trans person to receive sexual reassignment surgery from Magnus Hirschfeld, disappeared. And it's not known if she was killed during the raid or if she just went into hiding and never came back out. But Doran Richter disappears from the annals of history at this point. The first person, the first person to receive a sexual reassignment surgery at the Institute for Sexual Studies. Gone. No, no evidence of her, of her existing after this. And on May 14th, Magnus Hirschfeld re, uh, travels to Paris. And that is where he stayed until he died in 1935. He could not return to Germany. The police, after the, after the night of the burning declared that the sexual the Institute for Sexual Studies was to be permanently closed. It was Ger Adolf Hitler's government, via the police, declared that a medical institute that helped gay people was closed permanently and would never open again. All those people just passed out. Their jobs, gone. Their w life's work, gone. Some of them likely died in the process. And unfortunately... In 1942, there's one last very sad piece that we have to talk about here, which is in 1942, Magnus Hirschfeld's sister, Rekha Tobias, and keep in mind that she worked and lived with him in the Institute, didn't leave Germany. She didn't flee Germany, and she died in the Terzin Ghetto on the 28th of September in 1942.
And by then, Hirschfeld and his sister, both of whom were greatly influential in maintaining the work, were gone. They were both dead. And unfortunately, that's the end of this story. And you know me, I never, ever, ever, ever end on a doomer note, but we have to take a moment here to just dwell on this. We witnessed right-wing, hateful, fascist paramilitaries with the backing of the state, with the backing of the law. What they did was legal. What they did was even when it wasn't legal, like destroying an institute, was ignored because the state was favorable to their interests. Despite all of that, despite all of those victories, there wasn't a budge where it mattered. And this is why it is so important that we pay attention to meaningful victories, not just uh, virtue signaling, not just, yeah, yeah, gay people are okay. We need things that stick. And we have to remember that the state is rarely on the side of marginalized people. There was no point in this story where the state was supportive. At worst, they were, at best, they were neutral. And at worst, they were murderous. And it resulted in the death of not just the beautiful individuals who had made their life at the Institute for Sexual Studies, who had changed the world forever for gay people. Not just their death, but the death of their knowledge, their history, the information they had pried from reality. They had devoted their lives to synthesizing out of thin air. Gone.